So, um, hello, and thank you all for joining us today for this virtual event to welcome our new Meritai. Um, most of you know me because we've been involved in many graduations or things, but for those of you who don't, my name is Nancy Hermiston, and I'm the UBC University Marshal and the Chair of the School of Music's Voice and Opera Divisions. So I would like to take time to acknowledge that UBC's Vancouver Point Grey campus is situated on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. And I would also like to recognize that we, you are joining us today from many, many places near and far. And I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. Uh, we have muted everyone by default to avoid any interruptions in the speaking program. And we ask all attendees to turn your video on as we would love to see you and see everyone in this event. And uh, however, we respect your decision if you choose to stay hidden. Um, we will find you eventually. Um, <laughs> if you have a hard time hearing or seeing this presentation, then please just use the chat feature to notify us and our team will be monitoring the chat throughout the event and will help resolve your issue, we hope. Um, feel free to use the chat feature to ask questions of the speakers and chat with other guests throughout this event. At the end of the speaking program, we will be asking new emeriti to stay in this Zoom meeting for a group photo with President Santa Ono and Emeritus College Principal Graham Wynn. Uh, please note that this event is being recorded for archival purposes. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce our hosts for today's event, Santa J. Ono, our President and Vice-Chancellor of UBC. Santa. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's lovely to see this uh, photograph of the event last year. And I can tell you that um, I try to um, have a joke with um, um, some of my daughter's friends, and I said that we've been reduced to Hollywood Squares or um, <laughs> the Brady Bunch, and obviously, they're all un under the age of 50, so they had no idea what I was talking about. And I'm, I'm sure uh, that sometimes you feel that's the case uh, with all of these days in Zoom. But thank you, Nancy. I'm very pleased uh, to meet all of you and to see many uh, friends uh, in, in this uh, virtual uh, celebration. And to welcome those of you who are new members of the UBC Emeritus College. It's really great to see many of the deans here uh, many people who have been part of uh, UBC for some time to celebrate with you, uh, your inclusion uh, in the UBC and Emeritus College. As you know, the college is only a year old as a college. However, as you know, Emeritus faculty have been involved in UBC's development for many years. In the UBC Association of Professors Emeritus, which became the Emeritus College last year formally, was the oldest association of its kind in Canada and demonstrated a 30-year commitment to encouraging and facilitating the involvement of emeriti in the university. And all you have to do is look around um, the different uh, uh, screens of, of all of you in attendance to know that you are very active and very valued members of the UBC community. When I see your faces, I think about UBC. You have defined UBC. Uh, you contribute not just uh, through teaching still and research in many cases, but in many other ways, as mentors to new faculty, to new presidents, and uh, to the students of the institution. And so I want to thank you for everything that uh, you have done to define what UBC is and to make it into such a special community of scholars. Um, you have given over $45 million to UBC through philanthropy and volunteered uh, in countless events. Uh, and uh, thank you for being there and being present and passing on the tradition of what is UBC to the newer members of the faculty and the students who perhaps will be the faculty members of the future. Thanks for your scholarship, your research, your participation in teaching and mentorship. 
I had a chance to look at all the things that you've been involved in over this past year, and you've given hundreds of talks and conferences, now many of them virtual, written thousands of papers, thousands, books and book chapters each year. And uh, uh, you serve still on boards and committees, uh, not just here at UBC, but nationally and internationally. You provide uh, advice to both provincial uh, and national and international bodies. And you teach uh, four credit courses or non not four credit courses uh, for people just trying to learn. And as I said, you mentor the next generation of faculty and students. Some of you still serve on the Senate, and I can say you carry a lot of weight in the Senate. And uh, those of you in the Senate know that uh, it's not easy to find faculty members who are willing to spend hours many, many hours uh, focusing on the work of the Senate. So for those of you who are in Senate uh, or who have served in Senate, a huge thank you from me to you for doing that uh, work, which is so important for the institution and not uh, acknowledged frequently enough. You've served some of you on the pension board, the research ethics board, and many other committees of this institution. The new members of the Emeriti College are joining a, a long-standing organization, but it's also a new institution, something that we hope will become a proud tradition in the institution. And I so wish that we could be together face-to-face, -face, but uh, when we are able to get together face-to-face, -face, once we conquer this pandemic, we will have the biggest party that you have ever seen at this institution to celebrate you. And so it's wonderful to be with you this, this uh, afternoon, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce Graham Wynn, Principal of the Emeritus College, to just say a few words. Thank you very much, Santa. Thank you for your welcome and your inventory of the contributions that our colleagues have made. It's a great pleasure to be here as principal of the college and to also be able to thank you and the provost for the support that you have shown and the initiative in creating the Emeritus College. Uh, I think that we are now very well positioned to be leaders in Canada in supporting faculty into and through their retirements, and there's ample and building evidence that we are in fact doing that. Camaraderie and connection, as well as inclusiveness, are the watchwords of the Emeritus College. And I want to make the point to the newcomers to the college that our inclusiveness is intended to span many axes. Uh, we are a big tent organization, and our ambition and hope is that we will be a place to which all former members of UBC, whether from clinical medicine through to teaching professors, librarians, and so on, will gravitate to find intellectual and social and other forms of connection and camaraderie. Of course, it's difficult in these times of COVID-19 to do this in exactly the ways that we have become accustomed to. We face all sorts of new challenges, and I think the college is well embarked on responding to those. Uh, the people who are here from the council will know that we have initiated in the retreat that we held recently a process of re-envisaging the Emeritus Council, trying to define more clearly the various inward and outward facing activities in which we are involved and where we can make a contribution. And through that, uh, I hope that we will gird our loins for even more uh, adventurous activity on the campus front in the next little while. We're also being forced by COVID-19 to shift to virtual meetings. Uh, this is of course a prime example, uh, President Ono has hosted the group at his uh, house, on Mackenzie, Mackenzie House in the past, and it's been a wonderful occasion for people to join in, in conversations and to meet new people and old alike. We can't quite do that this year, but I think the shift to virtual communication also has real positives for a group such as ours. And uh, some of that was demonstrated yesterday when we had the first of the 
Emeritus College Conversations. Uh, three Emeritus colleagues and a moderator joined together to express their different perspectives from the faculties of law, arts, and, and pharmaceutical sciences uh, to give us some perspective on the pandemic. And then there were questions from the audience following their discussion. It was a lively, informative, and I think very well received event with about 90 people signing on. And we're holding a number of those in the next little while, uh, six over the course of the year. And so I hope that this is one dimension of outreach that the Emeritus College can use both to entertain the intellectual interests of its members and to burnish the reputation of the university. We need, I think, in the longer term to make sure that we reap the advantages of the digital world and events such as the pandemics conversation and combine them with the kinds of in-person events that we've had in the past that are so important to developing collegiality. So there's much yet to do. Uh, in the interim, I would just like to remind new emeriti in particular that in, a, in an attempt to bridge the gap between, as it were, the real world and the virtual world, I am initiating, as of tomorrow, what we're calling the virtual common room. Uh, it's an attempt to recreate on video an intimate kind of setting into which people can drop uh, as they wish, week by week, periodically or consistently, uh, for such conversation as comes up whether that conversation be about uh, books that we have read, issues that are confronting society, or indeed why the Canucks almost won the Stanley Cup. Uh, there's lots of opportunity uh, for us to engage in some casual exchange in that way. So anyone who wants to join can find the details on the new, in the newsletter that is posted on our website. Now we come to the part of the program that is an innovation this year because of our virtual circumstances. And this is the presentation by eight of our new emeritus colleagues. Uh, I am thankful to them for volunteering to speak for a minute. Uh, we asked them if they would do so in response to a couple of questions which we framed for them. Uh, one is to tell us if they wish a little bit about their plans, their important plans, and their hope for achievements uh, during their retirement, or at least the initial part of it. And they can either speak to that alone or include uh, an answer to a second question, which was to say a little bit about the ways in which they hope the Emeritus College might enrich their retirement. Uh, your college leaders are all ears to hear your answers, especially to the second questions, but I know that your responses to the first are going to be a fascinating and uh, inspiring variety of activities. So we'll move to those presentations. Uh, I'm going to call on individuals in sequence, but before we get to that, let me just say, uh, remind people that they need to unmute themselves uh, when they are called upon to speak. A slide will appear uh, with their being called upon. They have 60 seconds. Uh, we have ways in this digital age of cutting people off as soon as the 61st second appears on the stopwatch. So be warned uh, that your time is going to be strictly limited. Uh, more probably than imposing silence, uh, I will remind you in the usual way if you are over time. Uh, but I should also say, do remember to unmute yourself because any burbling silently while you fumble with the buttons is going to be deducted from your 60 seconds. So it's a tight script, but I know you're all aware of that and you're all old pros and that you all have interesting things to tell us. So let us move on to that. You can ask questions of the speakers in the chat room, everyone. Uh, please direct those questions to everyone in the chat room. 
and they will be monitored by myself and by uh, Sandra van Ark, and they will be asked of the speakers. But because we're moving on at some speed, please recognize that you should ask your questions while the speaker is speaking, uh, not wait for the end of the talk to then compose a question. So all of this needs to move along fairly rapidly. Okay. I think that's uh, about all that we need to do by way of preliminary. So if we could move to the first of our speakers, uh, this is Joran Fernland from Materials Engineering. And uh, as we can see, Joran has got the right idea of retiring, but certainly <laughs> not from life. Joran. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to this. Um, in a short summary, the three most important things I will focus on in retirement are to never stop learning, exploring, and growing. I retired early at 57, and I'm now president of the UBC spin-off company in the field of scientific computing. We have offices in Canada and US and work with organizations around the world and are developing exciting new technologies that enable anything from the future of aviation to clean energy. So that's my professional side. On the personal side, I'm trying to take up a new sport every year. Because of COVID, it's been three this year. It's been gravel riding, ski racing, and open water and swimming. And uh, in terms of the Americans College, I really hope that it will give me a chance to give back to UBC, stay connected with colleagues, and also a, a way for me to keep working with interesting people and engaging activities. So that was under 60 seconds. I'm used to being uh, late going on for 45, 50 minutes in my lecture. So that's uh, unusual for me. Thank you, Joran. Yeah. Other questions? Uh, okay. There was a question, yeah. gravel riding. Yeah. It's basically you ride a bicycle on, in, in the woods. On, in, on the, it's, sort of, it's sort of a combination of road riding and mountain biking. What sport for 2020? I'm actually, the, the latest one I picked up was actually open water swimming because all the pools are closed now. I've been started swimming in the ocean a few times a week. Okay. Thank you, Joran. Thank you. I, I was reminded when I saw your slide that uh, once upon a time, the Canadian Health uh, Ministry had a program called Participation. And uh, one of their taglines was that the average 60-year-old Swede was a lot fitter than the average 40-year-old Canadian. Uh, this <laughs> turned out to be uh, mythology, but I, that, I yeah. uh, think <laughs> that uh, much as we welcome you to the Emeritus College, <laughs> uh, don't expect us all to keep up with you in gravel riding and open water swimming. I appreciate Thank that. You. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Next, we will move on to Peter Grimmett. Uh, Peter is from the curriculum and pedagogy section of the Faculty of Education. And uh, Peter, over to you. Okay, thank you, Graham. Um, I would say I am not 57 when I retired I'm, because I'm 10 days older than you, Graham. Anyway, I'm wanting to uh, continue writing a book which attempts to restore the soul of teacher education by reclaiming the enchantment of curriculum and pedagogy. And uh, my beginning premise is that teacher education has lost its way, that it's lost its soul. And the best analogy I can give uh, in a quick uh, is walking through a forest like the uh, Pacific Spirit Park and coming across a riverbed and finding that it's obviously the site of a stream, but there's no water, only a bed, no flow. And pedagogy is like a stream. Um, it has its structures and activities, but if it fails to flow and has no spirit, it's just a stream bed and it, it fails to transform. And uh, with energy and with flow, pedagogy becomes the heartbeat and catalyst of study, which is the site of education. So what I'm trying to do is get some new spark into the field. Um, in a personal sense, I'm going to be spending the next couple of years caring for my wife because of some... Uh, heart valve replacement surgery and in terms of involvement in the college I hope to do enter into the in intellectual stimulation that the college can provide. Thank you Peter. Uh, there may be some questions coming up on the chat. Uh, maybe I can just hold the uh, empty airspace for a minute and say that uh, you recognize the closeness of our birthdays. What you didn't uh, mention for the crowd was that 
as undergraduates, we played rugby against each other for opposing universities in England uh, at yes. a date that I won't uh, reveal for people <laughs> listening in for sake of avoiding embarrassment. Neither of us can do that now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Peter. I'm sorry to hear about Maureen. Yeah. Uh, are there any questions for Peter? Not at this point. Okay. Well, I think in terms of keeping on track, we should move this along. So let me go next to Alexandra, Alexander Alex McKay uh, from Radiology. Thank you, Graeme. So uh, for the last 20 some years, I've been building an airplane, which has been, I met, learned an enormous amount, but a lot of great things. But I'd love to, I love my research. I love my time at UBC, still doing that. So it's taken a very long time, but now I've got to finish it. So it's moved a little faster since I've retired. And I'm hoping it'll fly this year. If not this year, already next year. I have two grandkids, hopefully more on the way, maybe, but they are really fun and they're really brightening my life. They're, uh, well, it's a, a life changing experience. And even talking to one just before this meeting, that's been fantastic. My life has been about uh, using MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, and I've been working on a technique called myelin water imaging. And I'm definitely not going to leave that. I'm selfish. I'm going to continue. And uh, But my colleagues are doing better work than me. And, uh, well, they're doing good work on it, I should say. And they're young, so they'll do better work. But uh, it's fun to see the next generation take things away. And in terms of the colleagues, I'm really looking forward to broadening my horizons. There's some... Uh, there's a lot of things I don't know because I've been pretty single-minded and I hope to be less single-minded down the road while I'm flying in my airplane and taking care of my thank, grandkids. Thank you, Alex. Uh, there are a couple of questions for you and uh, they both relate to your airplane. Uh, one is, does it fly with you in it? And Certainly. You me and one other person. You've been building airplanes. It flies with me and another person. And uh, it's a little shy. It's been over 20 years. I... Uh, I take my, take my work too seriously because I love my work. But um, it's been a wonderful thing. I learned a lot. If you want someone to know some about sheet metal, I don't know much, but I can build an airplane. I hope. Hello, sure. Santa. Definitely. Like I'll, uh, you're on. You're on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is that only at Christmas or? <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> Anytime. I was wondering what the range of your plane was. Uh, I'm disappointed it only has one passenger seat because I was hoping that it might be a means of incorporating our colleagues from UBCO if we could get you to run a shuttle back and forth. Sure, it'll be about a little over an hour, an hour and a half there. Oh, good. That'd be bad. Yeah, that'd be a beautiful flight. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Alex. That's really interesting. And I'm sure everyone's going to be following your plane building with some interest. Thank you. We'll move on now to Enrique Manchon uh, from the Department of Hispanic, Italian, French, Hispanic, and Italian Studies in the Faculty of Art. I've known Enrique for a very long time, and I'm delighted to have him here because he's been a stalwart of the faculty uh, as a teaching professor and as a generally all-round uh, contributor to the work of the faculty. So, Enrique, it's over to you. Well, thank you, and uh, hello, everyone. My retirement endeavors. One is to achieve a sense of calm. I have enjoyed teaching, but the preparation required was always accompanied by a wearing anxiety that I am ready to leave behind for good. Otherwise, I plan to transition from the analysis of language patterns to the photographic analysis of the world out there, i.e. the encrypted signs that comprise the language of our surroundings. As an example, I referred you to the two interrelated photographs in this slide. I hope you can see them. The first displays an evocative message painted on a wall in Havana. The second shows the same wall with the message subsequently erased by the effects of time and ideology. The message itself, I think, befits our stage in life. I translate and leave you with this thought. What are we and what will we ever be but a single history, a single idea, a single will for all time? Thanks. And keep well. Thank you, Enrique. 
I was fascinated by your interest in the transformation of the wall and, and the transformation of landscapes, because that is something that has long been of interest to geographers. Mm. Uh, we talk about the landscape as a palimpsest sometimes, uh, a manuscript in a sense that's been written over time and time again. And I was certainly reminded of that by your, your changed wall. So I hope we can have a conversation sometime about how geography and your interests come together. That would be great. Yeah, that would be it's fantastic to see the transformation of space in general. Yes. Okay, I don't see any other questions for you, Enrique, so we will move on. And uh, next we will move to Bruce McManus, uh, who is going to speak to us from the pathology and laboratory medicine uh, section of the Faculty of Medicine. Thanks very much, uh, Graham. Hello, everybody. Uh, my brief uh, remarks will focus on writing, uh, nurturing, and uh, I'm going to, I'm, I have been working for some time on my father's memoirs, uh, memoirs of his family uh, when they immigrated from Scotland. And uh, my sister and I are going to publish this as a book uh, to distribute to our very large fam family. Uh, he was a scholar at heart, even though he was a grain farmer. I'm revising and publishing a novel that I've written over the last 20 years uh, and haven't had time to finish. And I'm going to be writing more frequently in my blog, hardhawk.ca, which is a, is a thought, it's a thought place for uh, people to respond to uh, ideas about life. Meanwhile, I'm uh, advancing some work on uh, heart, uh, studying the mechanisms of heart muscle injury uh, in COVID-19 especially, and this is led by a promising uh, Michael Smith Fellow, whom I supervise. And I'm also uh, getting enjoyment from the game of golf with my grandson, who's a grade 9, 14-year-old at South Delta High, uh, he can outdrive his grandfather now, so that makes uh, it a lot of fun. And the biggest uh, goal I have is uh, laughing a lot and sharing that laughter with uh, family and friends. And I appreciate this opportunity to be part of the Emeriti uh, in the in the University of British Columbia and the privilege that it, it brings. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bruce. Uh, there's a question for you, I think. Yes. Uh, can you see that? Or do you want me to read it? Uh, yes, I can see it. And uh, actually, my my father grew up in a time, of course, uh, where he was only able to receive a grade eight education. And um, he uh, he wrote all of the memoir by hand. And then my sister, uh, bless her soul, has entered it into a computer format. And we're editing it and reformatting it a bit and my son is very artistic and uh, he, we're going to draw a number of images pen and inks uh, throughout the the memoir and and so we have the content we just don't have the format and i would think within 12 months we'll have it finished thank you uh, there's a second question from Santa. Uh, your thoughts about the risk to young athletes who are COVID positive? Oh, that's <laughs> that's a that's a I would call that what I call it in, in my language is that's a two beer conversation, <laughs> and, or it's a two cup of coffee conversation. Uh, but um, clearly, um, heart muscle is injured. The uh, it not just in athletes, um, but also in in others, in in young in young children, in uh, in and adults, and the mechanisms are complex, but really uh, they revolve around direct injury by the virus, uh, the uh, the aberrant response of the immune system. And also, more and more, we've learned that the microcirculation throughout the body uh, is uh, often involved in um, microthrombosis or blood clots. And one of the reasons that you see damage throughout the, the whole body 
widely dis distributed brain, heart, lungs, and so forth is because it's really involving the virus loves uh, endothelium that lines your blood vessels because there's receptors for the virus on those blood vessels. I'll stop. But uh, heart muscle injury is really important in all sorts of people, including athletes in this, in this condition. There's a question about how you can get that information out to the general public, and clearly that's important, uh, but I don't think we can disseminate it from here. So thank you, Bruce, and you might give some thought to doing that. I would also say that you might be interested in tuning in to the third of our pandemic of our conversations uh, through the Emeritus College on the 1st of December. Uh, this is going to focus on life writing, and uh, three people who have embarked on that uh, will be speaking to that topic. So I realize that your memoir is slightly different, but uh, it is a life that is being written, was being written about by your, your grandfather. Thank your you father. very much, Graham. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let us move on. And uh, next we have Pittman Potter from the Allard School of Law. Pittman. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, thank you for having me. I'm still getting used to retirement, actually, and the schedule management is particularly challenging. But um, I anticipate continuing to do China work, which is what I've spent my career doing. I have a new book coming out in November on China human rights and a new article for the Canada International Council's uh, special issue on the 50th anniversary of Canada-China relations. And uh, I don't think Huawei is going to consider those to be favorable, but nonetheless, I'm pleased to do them. Um, I'll also be involved in other things like music. I've been doing rooftop uh, guitar concerts to uh, enliven people during the during the shutdown, but I've also had a lifelong commitment to faith and spirituality and photography. So my slide shows a cover of a new book that comes out uh, and it uh, is intended to help us think about where we're going. Instead of thinking about how to get back to normal, rather think about where we're going and there are spiritual texts of photography that help people meditate on that. It's similar to my instructions to my graduate students, which is before they start building up reading lists and outlines, they need to think. And I think for COVID going forward, we need to do the same thing. So, so that's pretty much what my retirement will look like going forward. And I appreciate very much uh, the opportunity to be involved with the college. Thank you, Pittman. Are there questions for Pittman? I was going to ask you, Pittman, whether you had and had to hand a, a favorite text from your Fever Dreams book and uh, whether you could share that with us. Uh, well, there are 52 of them in there, and it's hard to choose, but one of them is uh, actually from uh, Paul's letter to the Corinthians, where he talks about God choosing what is foolish to shame the wise in the world and choosing what is weak to shame the strong in the world. And what that does is invite us to really turn on their heads our uh, contemporary ideas about what wisdom and strength are really all about. And that, in turn, helps us think about policy questions and where our human community is moving in terms of separating ourselves from the tried and true of the past, which has led to the levels of inequality and injustice that we're seeing brought into such sharp relief by COVID and encouraging us to think in new ways about what wisdom and strength are really about. Thank you. Sa Sandra has asked uh, what your ideas are about where we are going after COVID. After your contemplation of the contemplations, uh, have you seen a clear direction for the future? I think it varies with region and individual and country, but I'm happy to see that there is a broader recognition of the need to build more uh, equity and justice. So uh, last March, I think Bruce McManus was there, actually. I gave a talk at the IAR and the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs on the COVID impacts in China. This was in March before I went into individual isolation because I have a high vulnerability situation. So in any event, in that, I said, look, COVID affects women disproportionately, gender violence in China, uh, ethnic minorities in, disproportionately, the locking up of the Uyghurs and the disease that has followed, uh, uh, poor disproportionately, and uh, the example of the uh, migrant labor in China, and also age questions disproportionately, which has an impact on what sorts of budget commitments are being made at the expense of future opportunities in order to deal with a contemporary issue and perhaps some of the future issues which are still with us 
like climate change may uh, not get the attention they deserve. So I gave that talk in uh, March and really I thought about this for a number of months afterwards. And I thought, I thought that a, a, uh, an exercise in contemplation and meditation would be a very useful way for us to start because the issue is not thinking about COVID as much as it's thinking about ourselves. And again, this goes back to the, the line I used to give my graduate students, which is before you start putting up your reading list and writing your outlines and so on, you need to think about what it is you're trying to do and what it will mean and all that sort of thing. So this is an opportunity to try and do that. Thank you, Pittman. The Emeritus College is a wonderful place for us to do that. So look forward to your participation in our events. Thank you. Uh, I look forward to that. Let's move on. And uh, next we have Pat Shaw who began in linguistics but is now in anthropology as she is the founding director of the Endangered Languages Program. Pat? So thank you, Graham. When we were asked what are the two most important things you plan to do during your retirement, um, it was hard to focus on a mere two things. The overarching question that I hope my work has and will continue to contribute to is what is it that makes us uniquely human? I work in close collaboration with a number of indigenous communities in British Columbia on the revitalization of their critically endangered ancestral languages. So retirement for me is really this exciting prospect of an extended sabbatical without the paycheck to continue a number of ongoing research projects. On the second last nine of my slide, um, you see an expression that doubtless you have heard before, haichuka. Um, and unfortunately, the circle shifted a little. Um, but if you take a look at the second word, which is the pronoun you, you'll see that it violates a putative universal about human language, namely that all words are composed of syllables that have a vowel as a nucleus and doesn't. So my question here is how to explain the vowelless words of Salish languages and how do they fit into a universal theory of what a syllable is? So, hi, Thank you. Are there questions for Pat? Pat, I have a couple of questions about what I will call the orthography uh, of indigenous languages. Yes. Uh, one relates, I guess, especially to the point you raised about uh, the the indigenous thank you. Um, to what extent is the vowelless nature of that central word a product of the particular orthographic effort to translate uh, in, indigenous spoken language into something that more or less, but not completely, corresponds with our familiar alphabet? This particular orthography is actually quite phonetic. Um, it was developed in collaboration with the community. Um, so what's interesting there, this really is a vowelless word. There's no vowel in the middle of it. Um, but the upriver dialect has actually, one of its diachronic changes is it's put a vowel in there. And that may well be the influence of English. Um, so it in the upriver is chuh. And over on the island, that dialect has actually just left out the second consonant there, the like we would say at the beginning, some of us would say at the beginning of words like which, when, where. Um, and so they've just got a single consonant there as opposed to this, this sequence of consonants um, to be able to sustain it without a vowel. Um, so these vowelless words are very rare in the world's languages, but they aren't unique to Salish. They exist in Berber in Africa. They exist in, in the mountains of Taiwan, um, et cetera. So it's um, not just an orthographic issue. It actually becomes an issue of what kinds of sounds can form those kinds of syllables and what kinds of words can sustain that. This is a pronoun. It's used all the time. The pronoun you. The pronoun for we is also vowelists. So it's interesting to look at what can and can't sustain communication without a vowel. Thank you very much, Pat. Uh, there were a couple of people who followed in the questions uh, pointing to languages that had no vowels, uh, but you touched on that in your answers. So thank uh -huh. you. 
I think we should move on uh, to our final speaker here. And uh, this is Bill Winder from French, Hispanic and Italian Studies. And it's good to see you again, Bill. And uh, I'm you. handing over to you right now. Yes. Um, you know, the, the, in fairy tales, the last to speak often brings a curse. And um, I think I'm going to do that with a kind of a taboo subject. Um, my PowerPoint image suggests that I plan to become a firefighter. I hope that won't be necessary. We will see. But there are clearly other kinds of fires um, to fight. And the literal fires in the U.S. were stoked by the financial fire starters um, of our economy. I think that's fairly clear. The Amazon is literally being torched for profit. And climate change has called unprecedented fires around the world. Uh, for over 50 years, the fossil fuel industry has blocked any real action on the climate. And now it looks like the only response is to disrupt the oil pipelines, to disrupt the money pipelines to the fossil fuel industry, and to disrupt the politics that protects business as usual. Um, this is the moment, and that's the project, which should keep me busy, not off the street, but rather in the streets. And that's about it for me. Thanks. Thank you, Bill. Yep. Uh, I'm sure that there are lots of people who share your sentiments who may not be quite as ready as you are to rush into the fray, uh, <laughs> but I certainly look forward to hearing about how your, your protest actions uh, work out. Uh, some people have asked whether you have participated in previous demonstrations and whether you are afraid of ending up in jail. Yes, um, I've put um, going to jail on pause uh, because of COVID. Um, I would probably, that would probably do me in, but I have uh, bank occup occupations and so on. And basically it's a question of what Extinction Rebellion has been doing in England to, um, well, in uh, Great Britain and elsewhere in the world is to kind of um, uh, amplify what they've been doing and especially to get the unions involved. That seems to be uh, a crucial um, combination. So far, it's been, I'm sure everyone's aware of the climate march uh, that the sustainability teams organized uh, last year with, I, I don't know what the number was, but probably 150,000 people in Vancouver. So um, there's certainly a lot of interest, um, but there is a, this has happened at UBC very clearly when there was a di divestment vote the uh, board of governors who had um, a lot of people who had their livelihoods in the fossil fuel industry voted against it. So even though the faculty and the staff and the students had voted for it, it took a new generation of uh, board members to actually uh, approve, uh, uh, to move out of the fossil fuel uh, investments. Um, and this is still going on. Obviously, it's a big institution and things move slowly. But um, and, and as well, I'm very happy to see that we have now a fossil free uh, pension fund. And so I'm just uh, I just want to this is the moment when I have, let's say, the time to, um, as you say, jump into the fray more so. Thank you very much, Bill. Uh, I think we should begin to bring things to a close here. Uh, we did begin with our super fit 60 something year old Swede and perhaps it's appropriate that as we end with your protest against uh, global climate change, uh, we are reminded of another Swede, uh, Greta Thunberg, uh, and one of our panelists or audience here says that he just saw the Greta film at the Toronto International Film Festival last night. So. Uh, there's lots of action on this, and it surely is, like the other things that have been raised, an important issue. So I want, at this point, to thank each and every one of those of you who have presented for your interesting perspectives. They have been markedly diverse, engaged, and fascinating. And I note that earlier in the chat line, uh, Wendy Yip offered the observation that she loved how you – uh, she was talking of our speakers, but I think the implication is emeriti as a whole are all Renaissance people. And the diversity of interests each of you has uh, spoken about today 
really does speak to the potential of the Emeritus College to engage these kinds of cross-disciplinary, cross-silo kinds of conversations. So thank you all, and thank you to the audience for listening. And I'm going to ask Santa at this point whether he has any uh, final thoughts and remarks to make. Well, thank you very much. I'd just like to say that uh, this has been fascinating, and I've really enjoyed every single presentation. Um, with the last uh, uh, presentation, I'd love to meet with you and talk to you a little bit about uh, that transition that has occurred. And you're absolutely right uh, that it's changed quite a bit uh, from that vote, the famous vote several years ago when the board wouldn't entertain a divestment to now a place where we are actually actively not only divesting, but also thinking about investing in a way that will uh, ensure that the planet uh, is sustainable that we combat the kinds of fires that are, are really quite scary uh, that we're seeing ravaging the West Coast of, of, of the United States. I'd love to meet with you. Bruce uh, chatted and he said we should uh, invest in, in uh, more sustainable vehicles and electric bikes and things like that. Actually, you'll be hearing from me very shortly about exactly doing that. And so keep posted about that. And Bruce, we can talk more about that. Uh, <laughs> Bruce, I can't wait to be in the same room with you so I can see your glasses. Your glasses are are really the most inspiring I see anywhere. And I'd love to see <laughs> your glasses uh, in person again. And, and I'm, op I'm ready for that two beer conversation about myocarditis. <laughs> um, but, and, but the other thing is, I, I, the one thing that I, I, I absolutely am sure about now, listening to all these wonderful conversations, uh, all of which uh, intrigue me, is that I can't wait for my place in the Emeritus College. And, and I can say that since the, the, the first inductee is at about one year younger than I, that perhaps is sooner or closer than I thought. So anyway, it's been wonderful uh, being with all of you. Um, it's an honor once again uh, to have you uh, within this college, within this university, uh, and be safe and be kind and, and, and Godspeed to all of you. Thank you very much, Santa. Uh, this pretty much concludes our event today. I thank everyone for coming. I just wanted to say in conclusion that I'm particularly pleased to see among our number, Janet MacArthur from UBC Okanagan. Uh, these kinds of events organized virtually really do open up the prospect of more engagement with our colleagues up in the Okanagan. And so I hope I haven't missed other people from UBCO, but I remember Janet from uh, years back when I was quite closely involved with uh, o uh, OUC. Uh, so uh, I hope that we can see more participation from our Okanagan colleagues. Thank you. Thanks to everyone then for attending. I'm just going to ask all of the new Emeriti and Santa to remain behind for a couple of minutes for the screenshot of the group that Nancy mentioned at the beginning. Uh, and I'd also, just in closing, like to thank Ceremonies uh, for their coordination and presentation of this event. So all others can now leave the meeting. Thank you for attending. Uh, in the next few seconds, you should uh, be able to, <laughs> and we will remain as new Maritime. Thank you. <laughs>